Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Rachel Massey and I'm the Senior Science and Policy Advisor with CHE, the Collaborative for Health and Environment. We invite you to put a note in the chat introducing yourself and where you're joining in from if you'd like to. I'm going to start with a few bits of housekeeping. CHE is a member group of the EDC Strategies Partnership, which is bringing you today's webinar. The partnership members, members include Healthy Environment and Endocrine Disruptor Strategies, or HEADS, a program of environmental health sciences, the Biomonitoring Resource Center, and the Health and Environment Alliance, or HEAL. CHE also hosts science discussion listservs and supports other collaborative programs focused on promoting environmental health and justice. If you're joining us by phone, you can download the slides from the webinar page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. For those who are online, we'll put that link in the chat now. The slides and resources section on that web page also includes links to some of the local organizations that are working to address the impacts of the Ohio train derailment, as well as materials from partner organizations that work to prevent disasters of this kind. We'll disable the chat during the presentations but please do type your questions in the Q&A box at any point, and we'll get to as many comments and questions as we can after the presentations. If you would like to activate closed captions, you can do that by clicking the button on the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded, and it's scheduled to last for 45 minutes, though we may go a bit over depending on the Q&A. With that, I'll hand things over to today's moderator, Cheryl Patton, Director of the Biomonitoring Resource Center. Cheryl? Thank you very much, Rachel. Can everyone hear me off just fine? Okay, good. Okay, good. Uh, welcome everybody to today's webinar. The topic is the derailment of the Norfolk Southern train in East Palestine, Ohio in early February, and the subsequent burning of chemicals contained in the train cars, which released largely unknown quantities of hazardous chemicals into the environment. Some of which may dissipate quickly, but some like dioxin could remain in human bodies and in soil for many years. The event has alerted the U.S. public to the fact that these toxic chemical accidents are not infrequent and that we currently have little protection from the occurrence due to inadequate regulations and the means to clean up the chemical mess. I'm pleased to uh, introduce our speakers today, Dr. Ted Shetler, MDMPH, a science director, science and environmental health network, and a member of Chase advisory team. Ted has worked extensively with community groups and NGO organizations throughout the U.S. and internationally, addressing many aspects of human health and environment. He has served as the on advisory committees of the U.S. EPA and the National Academy of Sciences. He's co-author of several books, including The Ecology of Breast Cancer. Today, he's going to receive, review the toxicity and environmental faith of the chemicals spilled and summarize initial and subsequent government and community responses and ongoing challenges. My great pleasure to introduce to is Molly Jacobs, MPH, a senior research associate and project manager at the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production. Her work focuses on advancing policy and programs to prevent chronic disease risks associated with environmental and uh, occupational exposures. She's going to ex explore today, in addition to ensuring support and protections for affected communities, how we can reduce our dependence on toxic chemicals and the manufacturing processes that generate them. So thank you very much, Ted, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Cheryl, for the introduction. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to join you today. Um, let me begin uh, with a brief description of what happened uh, leading up to and during this uh, derailment. On February 3rd, a train carrying hazardous materials derailed in East Palestine, Ohio. This occurred about 9 p.m. in the evening after an overheated wheel bearing went unnoticed until too late. In all, 38 cars derailed and an additional 12 were damaged. 20 of these cars were carrying hazardous materials. Contents of some of the cars immediately caught fire, as you see here in this uh, photo, and people nearby were evacuated. Three days later, on February 6th, uh, authorities extended the evacuation zone and released and burned off vinyl chloride from five tankers when there was growing concern that one of them might explode. 
This is a photo of the vinyl chloride being burned off on February 6th, three days after the derailment. And I just want to point out that this is a complex uh, mix of chemicals that are being burned in this fire. Uh, and a lot of novel chemistry is going on in this uh, plume that's uh, coming up from the uh, fire. It's unclear who made the decision to release the vinyl chloride from all five tankers and burn it in the trenches. I say that because there was conflicting testimony at a recent congressional uh, um, hearing about that. On February 8th, authorities announced that residents could return saying, air quality samples in the area of the wreckage and in nearby residential neighborhoods have consistently shown readings below safety screening levels for contaminants of concern. They went on to say that for those who would like air quality readings in their homes, Norfolk Southern has hired an independent contractor, CTEH, to take air quality samples and provide results at no charge to residents. Free testing of water from private wells in the impacted area will also be offered, they said. But for days, residents were told that there were no lingering health risks. However, many continued to complain of chemical odors, skin rashes, headaches, confusion, coughs, chest tightness, nausea, and occasional vomiting. So what was released? Uh, and what are we uh, thinking about in terms of the toxic contaminants that we should be concerned about? Uh, this is a slide showing the rail contents that burned or spilled. Um, and you'll see, of course, I mentioned the vinyl chloride. That was five tankers that uh, were ultimately burned. And then there were two cars that actually had polyvinyl chloride in them. Then there were a couple of cars with uh, two kinds of acrylates, butyl and ethyl hexyl ac ac acrylate, one with uh, a glycol ether, polyethylene, uh, a tank car with filled with petroleum lube oil that spilled but did not burn, uh, one that uh, contained propylene glycol, and then one that leaked containing isobutylene, and then cars also containing frozen vegetables, and one with semolina flour. Um, as mentioned, we need to be concerned about known or probable uh, products of combustion, and I've listed here what we know uh, happens when you burn vinyl chloride, it produces phosgene gas and hydrochloric acid as products of combustion. So those were undoubtedly produced. We were also immediately concerned about the possibility of dioxins and furans and other chlorinated compounds like chlorinated poly, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons that would be formed by the burning of both the vinyl chloride and the polyvinyl chloride. And indeed, soil samples that were collected and being sent to uh, Indiana for uh, disposal in a hazardous waste site were tested and found to have dioxins in just two samples at 700 parts per trillion. Uh, that was just a random sample from this uh, soil that was being sent to Indiana, but it points out the need for a more systematic analysis of the entire area around East Palestine for dioxins and related compounds. Acrolein was also measured in the air at elevated levels by a team from Texas A&M uh, University and Carnegie Mellon when they were uh, cruising around the neighborhood with a specially equipped van that was able to sample community air. And it's it's likely that this acrolein was a product of combustion from the chemicals at the site of the accident. Now on this slide, what I've shown is uh, several of the select compounds. And I, I wanted to show the variability in their odor threshold as well as their volatility. You can see that some are extraordinarily volatile and have a have a odor threshold that's very small. For example, the the top two acrylates um, have odor odor thresholds of of, of you know less than a, a, a tenth of a part per million, whereas vinyl chloride, one of the more hazardous chemicals that was released, has an odor threshold of about three thousand parts per million. Although there's a considerable amount of individual variability. Some are more volatile than others, so would be airborne more easily than others. And I've also so listed here some of the uses of these compounds so you can see what role they play in our material economy. Uh, in particular, I would point out the vinyl chloride, its primary use is a monomer for the 
uh, manufacturer of polyvinyl chloride plastics, which are uh, widely used in all kinds of consumer products. And here I've given a sort of summary of the toxicity of select compounds, and they're consistent with symptoms that were reported both by residents and also by cleanup workers at the site. Um, vinyl chloride uh, has as acute symptoms associated with exposure, drowsiness, headache, and dizziness. Chronic exposures to vinyl chloride can lead to long-term memory loss, uh, kidney and liver disease, and it is well known as a, uh, a as a carcinogen causing angiosarcoma of the liver and hepatocellular carcinoma as well with chronic exposure. Uh, and then I've shown here with these other uh, four compounds on the bottom of the slide, uh, what their uh, symptoms of acute exposure are. And you can see that these are exactly the things that residents and cleanup workers were complaining of. Eye and throat irritation, lung irritation, chest tightness, nausea, some vomiting, skin rashes, and so on. And that continued to be, uh, those continued to be symptoms that members of the community experienced for days following the uh, derailment. There are some, these are some of the uh, toxic uh, properties of known or presumed products of combustion. Um, as I mentioned, phosgene and hydrochloric acid were undoubtedly produced by the burning of the vinyl chloride, uh, and it's a severe lung uh, irritant when it is inhaled. Dioxins uh, are problematic at very low levels uh, because they are carcinogenic and have a variety of health effects, including immune suppression, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, adverse reproductive health effect, er, reproductive effects, and others uh, associated with low levels expo of exposure. Acrolein, uh, which I mentioned previously, uh, causes shortness of breath, lung irritation, nausea, and vomiting. And I'm assuming that perfluorinated alkyl substances were probably used in the fire suppressants at the site of the fire. And they have health effects uh, listed here, including uh, some are carcinogens, immune suppression, thyroid dysfunction, and others. Uh, and this will have to be watched uh, in, in the months and years to come if these indeed were used and uh, potentially get into the groundwater. This is a photo of a stream south of East Palestine, uh, at more than a mile south of the site of the derailment, 22 days after the derailment in what's called Leslie Run Creek. This creek flows south um, uh, into a, a series of creeks that continue to flow south until finally it reaches the Ohio River. Uh, and these uh, chemicals that are being stirred up here from the sediments continue to be a problem in this watershed uh, as, as the weeks go by. And it's my understanding that some uh, efforts are being made to aerate this, uh, the sediments here to try to be, extract the chemicals, but it continues to be an ongoing uh, challenge. So what are some of the questions that are uh, raised and what are the ongoing concerns so far? Uh, I would raise uh, as one immediate concern the validity of the air testing and communication by CTEH. This is the consulting firm that was hired by Norfolk Southern to test the uh, uh, air quality in the community and in people's homes. And in virtually all of the 500 homes that they were permitted to enter to test the air, they found total volatile organic compounds at less than 0 0.1 parts per million, which was the uh, uh, level of detect of their instrumentation. They used uh, instruments that are handheld that uh, operate through a, a photoionization detector uh, uh, technology. Uh, they are not nearly as accurate as uh, air sampling that is done through other technologies that systematically uh, collects air uh, over periods of time and then uh, analyzes it with more sensitive instrumentation. Uh, so I, I think it's important to keep in mind that that these snapshots of air testing in homes were probably not terribly accurate and do not invalidate the fact that many of the people in these homes were smelling chemicals and were continuing to have uh, symptoms while they were there. We also are concerned about mixture effects because the uh, people in town were clearly not exposed to single chemicals, but rather it was this complex mixture of chemicals that were spilled and burned and their byproducts. 
And then we'll be thinking carefully about the timeline of various pathways of exposure. Whereas many of the volatile chemicals will now have dissipated, uh, those that uh, are entrapped in sediments or in soil, when they make the way into groundwater, will present exposure opportunities that could extend for a long period of time. There are probably additional products of combustion that we don't even know about that will need to be identified through non-targeted testing of, of various environmental media. And then there are, of course, the long-term health and economic impacts for this community that will not be resolved anytime soon. And I would also like to emphasize the important for, importance for keeping an eye out for groundwater contamination because some people in this community are drinking water from private wells and are not on uh, the uh, community water supply. Uh, so if groundwater plumes are beginning to migrate, they could, they could eventually make their way into private drinking water wells. So among the lessons learned so far, I think it's pretty clear that this was preventable. We've learned that, that, this, that this happened uh, in, in some ways because the technologies that uh, could have prevented this have been resisted by railway companies who have uh, su successfully lobbied Congress from tightening air, air, air railway uh, safety uh, provisions. Um, it's also provided a public awakening to the hazardous materials that are routinely transported by rail. This was quite a surprise to many people, but I think it's also a larger window onto the hazardous material economy more generally. And I would point out, whereas this accident has brought attention to East Palestine because it was such an acute event, there are communities throughout the country that live in communities that, that are chronically exposed to hazardous air pollutants and water pollutants that come from the industries that are in their communities uh, where that's a part of their daily lives. And in these communities, there are many uh, community groups uh, and advocacy organizations who work tirelessly to try to support them as has begun to surface in the East Palestine area as well. I think that uh, the we should pay it, remember that the lived experiences of residents clearly conflicts with the reassurances that they've been given. The odors and symptoms that, they've, that they're experiencing are real, uh, and it suggests that there is some real variable sensitivity among uh, individual people. There are enormous personal, community, social, and economic costs which are on, ongoing. And I think finally, I'd just point out that there's been confusing communication. Uh, the Ohio, Ohio EPA and the US EPA were not well coordinated. The messages coming from the consulting company, CTEH, offered false reassurances when people were clearly uh, continuing to experience symptoms. There were very disorganized responses on the EPA hotline where people were calling a number that they were given and were getting given conflicting uh, information. And then I think uh, among the other problems with communication is when the authorities say that there are no health risks, and that's the language they used uh, from these levels of contaminants, what does that really mean? And the residents of the town have been very confused by that because they're sick. And the reality is that we don't know what the health risks are associated with this accident. We're still trying to characterize it. We don't know the levels of the contaminants in the various environmental media. We don't know what exposures are gonna be over a long period of time. And I think it's important for more accurate uh, and, and uh, uh, straightforward communication uh, that would be used by the authorities from the outset to try to uh, regain the trust of people who are now starting to wonder whether they've been told the truth from the very beginning. And with that, I'm going to pass this off to Molly. And to do that, I need to stop sharing my screen um, and try to figure out how to do that. There you are, Molly. Fantastic, Ted. Um, thank you so much. Let's see here. Um, what a wonderful review and um, an important uh, conversation that I'm really pleased that Che is um, sponsoring here um, for all of us today. Um, so as Ted said, um, this disaster was preventable. 
and it's exposed numerous failures to protect communities and workers. In the near term, we need to address the failures of train safety in the United States. We also need to build a more robust emergency public health response network to take care of the affected, not just the acute impacts, but being able to quickly set up a public health surveillance and medical monitoring infrastructure needed to address chronic health outcomes well into the future, including long latency diseases like cancers, especially given that the range of carcinogens at play, such as vinyl chloride or polyaromatic hydrocarbons and likely dioxins. But accidents will continue to happen despite our best efforts to improve safety measures. Technologies will fail, human error will happen. So if we really want to end the tragedies such as East Palestine, the East Palestine uh, derailment that make people and ecosystems sick, we need to move upstream and address our dependency on toxic chemicals. I was asked today to talk about some of the themes that my colleagues Joel Tickner and uh, Charlotte Brody and I wrote in a recent uh, op-ed for the Scientific American. So um, the link for this op-ed is on the CHE website for the webinar, and perhaps Kristen might be able to paste it into the link or into the chat. Um, so many news reports over the last six weeks have focused on the horrendous track record of the rail industry. But this type of derailment is just one of more than 20,000 hazardous material transport incidents last year, according to data from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. The majority of transport incidents have not been rail incidents, as you see in this chart, but rather highway incidents. But when trains derail, massive disasters do happen. As Ted described, there are more than 11,000 facilities that dot the landscape across the United States that either make, use, or store chemicals. And many of these facilities are located in low income and communities of color and in areas with natural hazards that are likely to be exacerbated by climate change. Our colleagues at the Coalition to Prevent Chemical Disasters have maintained a chemical incident database since 2020. And as mapped here, they found that on average, every two, on average, every two days in the United States, a chemical fire, explosion, or toxic release is happening. So safer alternatives are available but we don't have an extensive inventory of an inherently safe alternatives that can meet the functional needs and applications for the range of toxic chemicals on board that Nor Norfolk Southern train. Nor do we have um, available to us a, a range of alternatives to meet specific functions currently provided by our, our, our inventory of solvents or preservatives or flame retardants. Is it possible? Yes, but as you can see in this figure, um, there are far more chemicals of concern than there are safer options. And to accelerate this development um, and availability of safer and sustainable chem uh, chem chemicals requires government coordination, investment, collaboration across the industry, as well as meaningful engagement with, uh, with academia and communities. Innovation in chemistry and chemical processes are critical to finding the alternatives to our toxic options, but they can also address the industry's significant contribution to climate change and also to plastic wastes. In the wake of the uh, 1984 Union Carbide disaster, preventing pollution at its source became a national priority fully eliminating the use or at least substituting dangerous chemicals with safer alternatives was seen as the most effective strategy to protect human health and the environment. And by the mid 1990s, the emergence of green chemistry and green engineering challenged us to rethink the molecular design of chemicals, which could in fact be, be, be made to be benign by design. This new era of chemistry is now seeing the light of day in policy frameworks under the European Union's Green Deal and its chemical strategy for sustainability, which is helping to guide our next generation of chemicals to be safe and sustainable by design. 
We also have opportunities before us in the United States, like the Sustainable Chemistry R&D Act, which can help ensure that the massive investments that are being made, for example, using the Inflation Reduction Act to decarbonize our economy, also address the toxicity and hazards of our chemicals and materials. The Sustainable Chemistry R&D Act tasks federal agencies to incorporate green and sustainable chemistry requirements into their programs. The aim of the legislation is to increase innovation, coordination, and, and investment in green chemistry and sustainable chemistry across all federal agencies. The Inflation Reduction Act is one example of, of a case where we have billions of dollars um, uh, for possible investment, um, and specifically through the IRA's Advanced Industrial Facilities Deployment Program to support the development of advanced industrial technologies that drive carbon emission reductions um, in key emission-intensive industrial sectors, including the chemical sector. Never before have we seen billions of dollars available to help us with the capital investments um, needed to put steel in the ground um, for a safer and sustainable chemical sector for the generations to come. Um, so we need to commit uh, to moving upstream to solve this problem at its very source. The East Palestine community needs our continued support. Train workers and hazmat and emergency response workers need our continued support. And I want to honor the work of so many grassroots and research organizations providing tremendous resources and support to those in East Palestine, as well as those working to enhance regulatory safety provisions for the future. And I want to urge all of us not to lose sight of the fundamental change that is happening on a much slower pace, but one that needs to be accelerated a change towards sustainable chemistry future, such that the East Palestine disaster is a figment of a, a past industrial way of operating. And so with that, I want to end with the powerful storytelling of, um, of our environmental health champion, um, uh, uh, Sandra Ste Steingraber, um, who in her uh, movie and book, Living Downstream, um, has for us there was once a village along, along, along a river. These residents noticed an increasing number of people drowning among those caught in the river's swift currents. So the townspeople went to work, devising an increasing array of technologies to resuscitate them. So preoccupied were these villagers with the heroics involved in rescuing and treating the victims that they failed to look upstream to see who was pushing them in the river. And with that, I'll pass it back to Cheryl. Thank you very much for both of your excellent presentations. We're gonna move now quickly into the Q&A session and we'll go to as many questions as we can. Uh, we have limited time, but we'll do this. And I will start uh, reading out some questions and just either Ted or Molly, perhaps one of you or both can take them on. Here's one from uh, Molly Birnbaum. You mentioned air testing in homes. What kind of testing is considered for sampling, paneling, furniture, et cetera? Where is there likely some kind of absorption and potential for future off-gassing? Anybody want to take that well, on? I think I understood the question. Um, yeah, the, the, the question is getting at the fact that there's off-gassing for many materials in our homes. Yeah. And uh, a lot of that reflects the furnishings, for example, or the paint, uh, or the personal care products that we have in our homes, and they and they will vary. But many of them are volatile, and so there are methods for collecting air samples, um, and and there are different methods for doing that. Uh, there are air sampling tests that can be done where you periodically co collect in a uh, in a in a device, collect the air samples, then take them into a laboratory and analyze them for various compounds. There are also some newer techniques like these uh, silicon wristbands that uh, people can wear around their home. And then after they've worn them for a while, they can be analyzed in a lab. So there are test methods for doing it and they will show different things depending on the products that are in the home. Okay, uh, I, it's Daniel Savory. I would suspect that at least part of the reason folks are having health impacts is due to the cumulative impact of being exposed to so many chemicals. Even if the individual levels of chemicals are safe, 
Could the EPA possibly then know the impacts of inhaling multiple carcinogens? Perhaps a rhetorical question, Daniel says, but welcome, he welcomes thoughts. Comments to that? Well, I, I can start. I mean, I, I, I do think it is a combination of both. It's, you know, it is the individual, it is the mixture. I mean, inevitably it is the mixture. And, um, you know, what I, what I think is quite compelling though, is as, as what Ted mentioned that, uh, what symptoms we see actually align very well with the chemicals that were spilled and burned. Um, so, you know, we have direct, uh, information from SDSs and from fact sheets that tell us what the acute impacts um, could be. And in fact, in this case, turned out to be the case. So, um, you know, whether or not the, you know, I, I think all of us are just flustered and confused by the fact that um, we're getting reports that the levels are safe, but yet these impacts are happening. Um, but it is, I think, a combination, it, Ultimate, ultimately, what we're seeing is the, a mixture effect, but we're seeing also confirmation of, of you know, what is to be expected simply based on what we know these chemicals can do. I don't know what you think, Ted. I would agree with you. I, it's a mixture effect. And, uh, and I think also there's the issue of individual susceptibility. Um, so, for example, some people are going to have an allergic skin reaction to an acrylate where somebody else won't. Mm -hmm. uh, but when somebody who hasn't had skin reactions uh, suddenly gets a very strange rash and they're being exposed to a chemical that causes a very strange, it causes a rash. I mean, it, it sort of follows that that's probably the cause, but it is a mixture effect. I agree with you. Okay. Uh, another question, uh, just saying that, that you mentioned looking upstream and what do you suggest can be done to prevent uh, industry from uh, 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 not standing in the way of, of uh, putting in place more effective regulations, more adequate testing. Isn't that a prime problem that we are, we have now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is a prime problem. Um, you know, as Ted said, it was industry that was standing in the way and derailed a lot of safety measures um, that were putting forth by Congress to improve trail, you know, rail safety to begin with. So, yeah, we have an uphill battle because industry wants um, things to be uh, uh, it, it, at a place that um, you know preserves their profits and and but yet you know I th I think as as what you know, Ted mentioned in his presentation this is a wake up call you know I think all of us were floored to see that you know our frozen vegetables were being shipped alongside vinyl chloride. We had no idea that these freight trains included these hazardous materials alongside just commod you know commodity products. Um, um, and so I, 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 all, all I can say is that you know it takes this community um, to stand up and to push for um, you, you know the partnerships, the collaborations, the regulatory change, the investment, um, to make the shifts that are necessary. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Leslie Pacey uh, talked about experience in his Alabama hometown along the Gulf Coast during the BP oil spill, BP oil spill in 2010. People were told the oil and toxic chemical dispersants were safe, but their bodies suffered short-term cold and flu-like symptoms, rashes, bleeding, and so on. And today they have elevation in there where they have elevations in chronic disease and cancers among oil response workers and exposed coastal residents. So this is, you know, 15 years later, 12 years later, when people feel sick and their animals are dying, it's not safe. What kind of independent testing of air, water and particulate matter and what type of biomonitoring is currently uh, underway in Palestine? Do we know more about that? Is anybody well, I, I do know that uh, that a... Uh, a soil sampling uh, project was proposed by a company that, again, was contracted by Norfolk Southern. And I don't know the extent to which that uh, plan is going to be implemented, but it raises the whole question about independent testing. Um, and my view is that Norfolk Southern should be absolutely financially responsible for the entire cleanup here but that they should not be in charge of selecting contractors to do the analyses. 
Uh, that just makes no sense. There's an obvious conflict of interest. It's not hidden. It's obvious that they have a conflict of interest and there should be independent third party uh, uh, con uh, people employed or the agencies doing a competent job. But then we have to be looking both not only at air, but also water. And as I mentioned, need to be looking at water over time. Uh, groundwater and drinking water quality and we need to be looking at soil and that soil uh, sampling plan has to be carefully thought out because we don't know where products of combustion may have been deposited but we have to look at where the plume went depending and and that's knowable from what the meteorologic conditions were at the time of the fire uh, and then we need to systematically look and I also would point out that with the cleanup efforts that are going on, they themselves could begin to mobilize contaminants. So that stream I showed, uh, the Leslie Creek with the chemicals floating in there, um, that those are being stirred up from the sediments. And if, this, if, if those stream sediments are being aerated by an attempt to uh, mobilize the chemicals so they can be extracted, they're going to be put back into the air again. So the cleanup and the analysis of the cleanup needs to be, be done very carefully, and it needs to be done by uh, some organizations that do not, do not have an obvious conflict of interest. Any comments uh, about what to do with the residue of the fires has been suggesting to moving them to a, a company that does an incineration of for PFAS and dioxins and so on. Uh, up north is called Heritage Companies, and they have a something like 25 uh, offices across the United States, two in California, actually, but mostly in the Southeast U.S., or taking the residue and putting it in landfills. Oklahoma has declined that. Michigan is possibly a site. Uh, there's also a possibility of taking the, 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 the refuse and depositing it in um, deep wells outside of Houston. Any comments about that? How do we get rid of what we've been digging up and trying to get rid of? Well, in my, in my view, what this is doing is, is showing how once we've made uh, this mess, but this is an example of messes that have been made before, then then we then we're stuck with trying to solve the problem. We end up distributing it around the country. As you pointed out, Oklahoma, the governor uh, resisted taking a, a shipment of this hazardous uh, soil that had been uh, excavated from East Palestine. Um, and uh, ultimately, the EPA said, no, you can't do that because that's interfering with interstate commerce. So now we realize that we have a part of our gross domestic product uh, in our reflected in our commerce in hazardous waste. Uh, now, Oklahoma was going to be putting it into landfills. And as you pointed out, others had proposed putting it into incinerators. So an incinerator, if it isn't properly operated, or even if it is, it's going to have some hazardous air pollutants. They're going to disperse some of the toxic uh, materials over the landscape there. Uh, there. There's no good answer to this. We, we have to deal with it. But uh, as Molly suggested, we ought to be thinking about how do we prevent uh, producing this hazardous waste in the beginning. And that's, of course, our ultimate challenge. Molly, you may have more to add to that. No, I just, I think that the answer is the not good answer. We don't have a safe disposal solution for this, period. There is no such thing as a safe disposal solution. We're we will distribute it around the country. There will probably be um, uh, uh, chances of continued releases, no matter what form it's in. We know that PFAS, for example, are not fully destroyed when we incinerate them. Um, and, and there's movement ab abroad in a number of states that have like holding programs for, for PFAS products because we know we can't incinerate them. Um, there is no good answer. There's just none. I know it's just incredibly frustrating. A couple of comments, just I'm gonna read from chat so everyone gets a chance. Uh, somebody said, uh, Rick side to host some panels, just so everyone here knows there are a lot of chemicals still in our creeks and they're not cleaning the creeks, even a quarter mile out of town. And Rick Sai says, 43,000 fish kills for five miles, killed all Bactria, fish, frogs, all dead for five miles, still this way with chemicals in the creek by his home. So that is just boggling to me. Uh, Someone asked, is there any information about emergency department or urgent care visits related to the incident? Is there any information about services being offered to the community clinic to set up by the state? Is there any kind of uh, 
a survey to see which pe people might have been pregnant, women pregnant during this time, so that there might be follow-up health surveys for these women and their uh, their children who may have been exposed in utero to some, some fairly powerful chemicals. And do we have any information about that? You know, I, my my colleague Polly Happen re recently just shared with me that ATSDR and CDC, I think, are being deployed to this region that might start, you know, understanding some of that. But this is one of the things I mentioned, you know, early in my talk was is a major gap. We, you know, we're doing we're, what we're hearing in, in the news is a lot of the environmental monitoring. Um, we're hearing about kind of the the, the near term health impacts. We are not set up yet to study this for the long term. Um, there, there, there is not an infrastructure in place to support um, public health researchers to do that line of questioning and to understand and connect the dots between exposure and disease. We do not have that yet here. It needs to be set up. It was set up for Deepwater Horizon. It was set up for the 9-11 incident. We don't have it yet here, but it needs to happen. Yeah. Uh, Rick Sai also says, since at this time no one is taking our contaminated dirt, it is piled sky high, higher than our industrial buildings and higher than the semi trucks. It's quite amazing. Uh, anybody, has there been any research on uh, the particulate matter from the smoke itself? Black carbon can be fairly invasive when people breathe it in, with some fairly severe health effects. Uh, do we know whether there's been any kind of testing uh, at all related to uh, carbon black and smoke particles? I have no idea of, of what people may have done with that. These smoke particles are going to be coated with with chemicals. Uh, th they don't just exist uh, in isolation, but out of a complex fire like this, the the carbon black particles are going to be coated with novel uh, chemicals. And so I have no idea if anybody did any captured any samples of the smoke, but it would be a very complex mixture and certainly right. worth knowing about. I remember seeing some um, some tracking and some conversations um, uh, that were happening um, among colleagues in southwestern Pennsylvania, um, where there were reports coming out, especially of, of those that were downwind of the plume, like in 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 in, um, in Ohio, where they were seeing quite high spikes of PM two point five, which you know black carbon is a part a part of. Um, so we do know that there were spikes of black carbon of fine particulate matter associated with these plumes that were that were you know headed he, you know headed north primarily north into ohio as a result of the fire okay so um could, Polly hobbins asks could you elaborate on what's needed to track health impacts of the disaster over time would it make sense to establish a registry with ongoing surveys and other assessments what do you think? We're kind of getting to what do we do about all this? Right. I mean, I, I thank thank you for that, and it's something that Polly Hoppin and I have been talking about. Yes, and yes, we 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 need surveillance systems, and surveillance systems. You know, some of the most robust surveillance systems are based on the establishment of registries. And again, I I, I go back to what we did for 9/11. It's 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 it was established. We were able to look at both short as well as chronic impacts resulting from those horrific exposures that happened over days, um, both among you know among uh, 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 emergency response workers as as well as you know those uh, those of the general public um, near the incident. So. I do think that something like that is is replicated. Granted, the scale here is much lower, but is still deserving of such public health response and understanding going forward. Um, I don't know if you have anything more to add on that, Ted. Well, I, I totally agree. A registry ought to be, and and uh, the sooner the better, because yeah. there are people moving out of town. They have sold exactly. their houses or left. Um, and I also am concerned about uh, potential exposures during pregnancy. And if we don't, if we lose track of people because they leave and they don't get entered into a registry, uh, we're never know, going to know the answer. So I think the sooner the better. And I agree with it, that being the right approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for those answers. Uh, Sarah Howard, a question from the chat, a bit of off talk, topic, but has there been any inf information about agriculture in an affected area, livestock experiencing side effects or illness? Any uh, traces of any of the chemicals being transferred to cow milk, for example? 
whether from the air, water, from livestock from being affected. Do we know anything at all about that? I'm not aware of any biomonitoring of livestock or agricultural products so far, but it's, ob it's an obvious concern. And this is a rural area where there is farming uh, and livestock uh, being raised. And so it's one of the reasons why I think the environmental media need to be really uh, uh, systematically studied because the community and all of us really deserve to know whether or not um, there's a possibility for these chemicals to enter the food chain mm -hmm. uh, through produce or through animal products. Uh, and uh, we have had, we, we've, I've seen a number of reports, but people who live in the community would know far better than I, but I've seen a number of reports of sick animals, uh, animals who were previously uh, healthy that uh, suddenly got sick or even died. Uh, and I don't know the details around them well enough to have an opinion about it, but uh, it's, it's an important consideration because people are going to be making decisions about what do they plant gardens this spring? Uh, mm -hmm. are we, what are we going to do with our, our cattle and so on? So uh, th these are important questions that need to be answered. Uh, and, and I think the sooner the better. I think it is. Okay. I think we've reached our, uh, we haven't made it through Probably we made it through about half the questions. We'll try to answer some of them uh, by uh, written communication later on, but it's time for us to close this webinar. I want to thank everybody for your excellent questions and also to Ted and Molly for the excellent presentations. And of course, Rachel for her facilitating and shape partnering with the, our uh, EBC strategies group to put on this webinar. We hope to continue with more webinars that can prove some of these more questions and, and, and more depth in partnership with many of you that have joined us. So we'll talk about and be in touch with you all later about that. So thank you again, everybody for joining and thank you to our presenters and our host. And I'm gonna take myself off uh, Victoria uh, video and go back to Rachel to close this out. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And thank you very much, Ted and Molly for your excellent presentations. And thank you so much for the engagement from today's participants and for the work that so many of you are doing to address chemical hazards. Um, I'll just uh, wrap up with a few quick announcements and I'll share my screen. There we go. Um, a, a video recording will be available on Che's website soon. And everyone who registered for today's session will receive an email with a link to the video. We also invite you to join us for upcoming webinars. Tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, we have the next CHE Alaska Partnership webinar, Making the Invisible Visible, the PFAS Project Lab, with Dr. Alyssa Cordner. And our next EDC Strategies Partnership webinar will be on April 13th. We'll be hearing from Dr. Brenda Eskenazi about her research on long-term health effects of childhood exposure to the herbicide glyphosate, and we'll put those links into the chat. If this is your first time joining one of our webinars, or if you're a regular participant, we hope that you found this information to be useful. We encourage you to support the work of any and all of the groups involved in the EDC Strategies Partnership. You'll find the links to each group on Che's Partnerships page. If you appreciate these webinars, please consider a tax dedu deductible donation to Che and or any of these partners. With that, I'd like to again thank Ted and Molly for speaking with us today, Cheryl for her excellent moderation, and Che Director Kristen Schaefer for all of her behind the scenes support. And thanks again so much to all of you for joining us today.